Hey there, folks, Rail here. Today, we're going to be talking about the expedience of play here on the Untitled TTRPG podcast. I have with me John, per usual, and uh, today's conversation is going to be pretty loose. We're just going to kind of have a have a normal human discussion, talking about normal, <laughs> normal human things. <laughs> yeah, I have a cat that's very needy at the moment, <laughs> right when I'm ready to record. So one of the the interesting kind of alignments that has taken place between OGL and the the need for new games is that some of these games have really keyed in on a specific problem that faces, I would say in particular, tactical combat design. So when you look at um, MCDM's, uh, MCDM's Draw Steel or uh, Nimble or DC20 or uh, Daggerheart, these games are all making accommodations to to expedite the process of play, particularly in the in the realm of combat. Dagger Hearts, I think a little bit, it's more over here somewhere, but MCDM, for example, like you always hit. And uh, in Nimble, instead of rolling a d20 to see whether or not you, you hit or you miss, you just roll the damage die, and then on a one on that damage die you miss, which is very interesting uh, as far as the design space is concerned. In DC20, you're still rolling, but you can like give yourself a bunch of advantage so that you don't miss... And then, uh, but on the other side of it, you're always dealing static damage numbers. So it's rolling less because I think there's this like, this idea that we need to get to the fun part of the game faster and kind of get rid of some of the accounting that we've been used to. And I think my, my question is just right out the gate is people who, who like tactical combat, do we actually like that because of the tactical nature of it or are we just familiar with it for the people who really want a game to go fast like there there are plenty other of other games that do that probably better where systems don't differentiate combat and role play as pillars they kind of just flow into one another so the same roles that you're doing over here in the role play pillar are the same roles that you're doing when it enters a sort of combat situation and i wonder if those uh people who are really uh being weighed down by how slow combat can be i wonder if if a portion of them would be interested in a different style of game altogether kind of like last time when we were talking about ability scores i i don't mind my abstract game objects being abstract game objects i am okay with having the story mode and then like the battle screen mode. And that might just be the video games I grew up on, like Final Fantasy. There's a different screen for traveling the overworld than there is being in a town versus being in a battle. But I'm, I've am i never found it jarring to go from, all right, we're doing the talking social interaction story development part into, all right, now we're taking out a battle map with minis and we're playing a board game. Um, I know that that's not every TTRPG community member's cup of tea, but it is interesting. I, I do wonder if that's like part of the, the key question to answer first is, are you okay with your games having like different modes or do you want everything to be streamlined in? Like the problem with fifth edition, especially the 2014 way the player's handbook is not really organized is that it makes everything sound the same as opposed to having these distinct modes of play i'm definitely one of those people who enjoys tactical combat i like to roll dice i'm also keenly aware of how long everything takes so th- there's this like interesting i guess social paradigm at tables where a lot of pe- people will be on their or like want to be on their phone or be distracted or not be invested in the the turn of somebody else i i wonder if as uh D's audience has kind of broadened over time or just in general have become more aware of these sorts of deficiencies at the table if we as kind of a ttrpg community have so it's two things first off we're really familiar with tactical combat it's like the thing that we know because we started with D, right uh rules light systems are over there somewhere they're really abstract to to a lot of people and they just wouldn't you just wouldn't know that a game can operate that way even though it might actually be better for you uh but if you do like tactical combat and or like or just very familiar and comfortable with it then we we still need to be aware of the taking some of the process out so that we can make room for i guess the fun part 
uh, of the game or it, at the very least decrease downtime so that more people can play. So that's where you see the impetus coming from, you know, getting rid of attack rolls. And, and there's other, other benefits to, to doing stuff like that too. But point being, we have, we're looking for mechanical solutions that I think are in a lot of ways uh, trying to compensate for the social uh, inequities between just the how, how we focus on a, on a table. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. And you actually brought up something that I think, all right, I'm going to make this very broad sweeping statement that probably doesn't apply to a lot of people. But uh, a lot of times I find in the TTRPG community, a lot of times certain words will get latched onto that are a great what, but not necessarily paying attention to the why. So for example, you're hearing tactical combat, um, Jeremy Crawford and all of the press for 2024. Weapon Mastery was designed for tactical combat. And it was, is it tactical combat or is it trying to make meaningful decisions? Because well, you could argue there were some tactical options that uh, say, uh, martial characters could make like shoving and, uh, grappling were options they could have taken, but it just, those choices, even though they were choices, they weren't meaningful choices. Cause a lot of times they were inappropriate to the situation. So really when I hear that players like tactical combat, they like having a few different choices that will meaningfully impact the battle or whatever. And so when it comes to expedience of play, Really, the thing you just hit on is, is its engagement. The reason that these designers want uh, to expedite the, the game mechanic resolution process of combat is because they want everyone to stay engaged instead of being on their phone. Um, and I don't think that expedience is the only design route to do that. Um, my example being that uh, there's another game. It's really clunky, and I, I definitely cleaned it up when I run it. But it's called Mechton, and it's the Gundam TTRPG that I mentioned last time. Turns actually take longer than D&D. &D, and yet, when I run that game, players tend to be more engaged. And the reason is not because there's actually more dice rolls that create more excitement to see what's going to happen. So when you roll to hit, not only are you determining do you beat their armor class or not, Second of all, the defender, it's an active role. So you're not you're not trying to beat a static number. It's always a contested role. So everyone's got to pay attention at all times. Um, and then even when you hit, you roll a die again to see which limb you hit. So it's even more detailed than just a standard armor class. But because everything is active and there's always this tension of, are they going to hit my arm or are they going to hit my cockpit or... Am I going to hit something that I can I can do without or is it going to be something that's like if I lose my weapon, I can't fight anymore because that tension is always there, even though it's a longer process, it's actually a more involved and engaging process. So I that's it's interesting how you speak on it from that perspective, because what I immediately associate with like, oh, hitting this limb and bypassing this, that and the other thing is crunchiness. And we use crunchiness as sort of like a bad word because it it implies complexity. And when I look at a game like, I mean, I have not played very much of the Witcher TTRPG at all, but when I read that book and try to decipher it, it seems like a crunchy system that is just uh, inelegant in its design. That's That's the thing that bothers me. Uh, complexity can can be there. Uh, depth can certainly be there. But I wonder what the the exchange rate is on the cost. So even when you talk about like contested roles, people are like, oh, don't like contested roles because because then both people got to be doing something and it just takes longer. And it, it, the way that you phrased it is like engagement. Uh, people are like they need to be invested in because they're like doing something. That's that's playing the game. And I think crunchiness gets mixed up in that a little bit because crunchiness should really be like accounting for the game. Like that's that's all the little numbers that you're adding on uh, to one another. And and the slowdowns, slowdowns can also be worthwhile if they are motivating you to action. So what are some other routes that we could potentially use to expedite play in a way that is meaningful yeah it's a it's a great question i've been asking myself over and over again um i think a lot of it has to do with how 
as a player, the more complicated a game gets, how much better you can organize your information. Um, and you know, I, for the, the little prototype for the game system, um, I'm working on, uh, I, I, you know, sent you guys the character sheet just to get some feedback on it. And one of the things I find even for D and D is that like, when you look at a spell casting sheet, it's organized by level, which makes sense because that's the resource cost. But even within level, you know, further organizing your spells in terms of function. So rather than like getting the utility spells mixed up with the defensive spells mixed up with your area of effect spells, knowing what your options are and having them pre-organized so that that way, when you see the situation, you can pick the option that's appropriate instead of having to take time to figure out what the appropriate option is. Your character sheet is, it's interesting to me because when you see a big void somewhere that says like, like up top, it says like support and you don't see any of your you know, spells or abilities or whatever in that space, it, it's kind of a, an indicator to let you know what you're deficient in and potentially even inspire somebody to pick up something like that. Like if I had um, a D and D character sheet that was like actions, bonus actions, and then your reactions, I think that'd be way more helpful when I'm trying to create a character because because that's what a lot of the the juggling or the deciphering that I'm trying to do is is like okay, am I blowing out my my bonus action economy or do, do, am I just do I even have any? And trying to figure that out actually seems to be the most difficult part of character creation. Yeah, and that was intentional what you said because um I, I just remember one of the biggest like arguments that happened at my table that you know it was just it was just interesting how it all came about is I had like an eight person party and. Like most of them were martial types. They were like fighters and barbarians or whatever. One of the players was a sorcerer. And we got into this fight where there was a horde of like 20 enemies. And everybody was like, sorcerer, use your fireball spell. And the sorcerer was like, I don't have fireball. My character concept is I don't take AOE spells. And I'm more playing support. And basically everyone was like, boo. And, and the reason was because there were like two or three other support characters already in the party. Um, so what the party lacked was a damage dealer. And the miscommunication was because that player was the only one playing an arcane caster as opposed to like a druid or a cleric. Um, they assumed that he would know that that was the gap to pick up those AOE spells because he was the only one with the class that had access to them. So yeah, understanding how to fill out the roles of your party so that that way um, the game is just more balanced and everyone has like a time to shine. Um, that goes right into the visual design, I, I hope anyway, of the character sheet. We'll see when I release it if people respond positively to it or not. How can we uh, increase? So let's, let's come up with the formula here. Actions times meaningfulness minus downtime equals uh, more fun. <laughs> something along those lines like how do we get to to that point uh with whatever we're designing it's going to come back to something we've been saying a lot uh i i truly think it comes first of all the expectations so like if we have a group that's going to play pathfinder second edition that group needs to go in knowing that as players they are expected to do homework of figuring out how their character works. Um, there's just way more mechanics in that system. Um, and so there are way more points where it can slow down. Um, and so to compensate for the fact that there's more to keep track of, the players have to take on more of the rules knowledge. Um, then I think uh, a lot of game master tables are traditionally comfortable with. Um, usually at my 5e tables that I run, it's gen generally assumed John kind of knows all the rules. And if you just tell him your build, he'll be able to remind you of things that are easy to forget, like bonus actions or reactions. So as a game master, I end up taking upon a lot of that mechanical heavy lifting um, at tables that I pl uh, that I run. Um, not every game master likes that. I've spoken to game master like, no, you got to know your character sheet. And if you forget, that's on you. Um, and that's totally fine. Um, it's just not the atmosphere I like. But like, again, if the expectation is this isn't about character builds, this is about just getting into the mind of your character and rolling the dice when you're told to, it's going to set up the dynamic to be a little bit smoother. Okay, so I, I'm wondering if our characters nowadays are, there's too much going on. 
And I think that, you know, you, we have a rules heavy system uh, being Dungeons and, and Dragons. At the same time, there's always there's this effort, especially like moving into 2024 to give you more stuff, it's more things to do. And but you and I both have played with people who are just like, yeah, they don't know what's on their character sheet. They wrote it down at some point. They might even have like a spell over here that they then have to look up in a book. That is not efficient use of time, anybody's time. And also, I feel as if you should be the decisions that you're making for your character sheet, you should be invested in, you should be excited about. You should know because it's that cool thing that you can do. You know, one of the things that bothered me about Dungeons and Dragons 2024 is the weapon mastery where what was a topple that like you have to just keep rolling so you can you can topple once on every hit and uh and then they have to roll to see if they fall over and that to me is just it's a slog it is not elegant it is not even necessarily engage it might be engaging for one person yeah like yeah take a hit and then i roll the dice and then i roll my damage and then you know but you're leaving everybody else out so I've I've made I paid very close attention to how many possible roles you'll have in a turn for for a player uh, in in distal, and being cognizant of that sort of of how you're designing things, I think lends itself to a lot of this sort of streamlined play that we want to experience, without necessarily even having to. I, I'm not trying to use this in a derogatory way, but cut corners on things like attack rolls or static damage numbers and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I I think the best argument for cutting out rolls, like cutting out the attack roll or cutting or using static damage, is it removes the number of baton passes between mechanics. Like, and that's usually like uh, we talk about it at you know our martial arts school. We talked about it. Um, at the family education center I used to work at, um, like each shift is kind of like a baton pass where where things get really like mucky in terms of time uh, or timing is when like someone doesn't communicate something or someone doesn't set up the next shift appropriately. So there tends to be even more time of recovery that's really inefficient and unnecessary. And I think what can happen for some groups is, you know, you roll the attack roll, you celebrate, oh, wait, what's my damage? And then I have to do my damage roll. And then I got to think of all my modifiers. And, oh, I forgot my rage damage. And, like, there are all these things that kind of factor into it. Um, I am of the same opinion as you that 2024, I think, added a lot of things. And it was just it's just interesting. Like, I remember James Hayek talking about on the Eldritch Lorecast that when 5e first came out, everyone was blown away by how quick it was because you just action move. Um, and then as we added more rules and added more spells, especially as we get to higher level play, you know, um, there are times now I'll have a multi-class martial character and they'll hit and they got weapon mastery. And then they also have battle master maneuvers. And then they also have rage damage. And then they also have a bonus action and they're trying to figure out, wait, do I need five D six or 66? <laughs> and there's like all these things that were added to a system that wasn't very streamlined in the first place. I get why Wizards of the Coast designed it that way because they had to be backwards compatible and they promised that everything would work. So they really couldn't remove a lot from the system. I but... don't know if that's true, <laughs> honestly. I So I, I think that the the loud minority is, is where a lot of the like, oh no, don't touch it because I like it. And I think the only way to really get change is to blank slate it and start something new. And so this, I think a lot of the, a lot of the sins of any of 2024's design are going to be that of the father where they just had, to, they said backwards compatibility. Therefore, they're kind of, they're kind of just eating it. But at the same time, they could have taken a harder line and, and said like, hey, it's in the best interest of the game. If we move, like move away from this particular uh, aspect of whatever uh and they certainly didn't need to add on to it with things like topple or, or like that doesn't even need to be a thing necessarily to me it's it's like they they're adding expansions and dlc to to 2014 and i again i've been there you just when you add more to it it'll please the the veteran players and it will come at cost 
to the game's integrity and, and health over time? Yeah, the way I think of D&D, to be honest, is like a Bethesda game. Bethesda games sell really well, um, but there's usually a joke among um, gamers about how it's like, finally, we have another toolkit for mods. Because exactly. really, yep. the best way to to play those games is with mod support to clean up all the glitches and all the deficiencies that are in it. And I look at D&D very much the same way, whereas a system it's kind of being shipped a little bit broken, but as long as they release an SRD for it, everybody else can kind of fix it. So that is my stance on 2024 is really interesting. Like I, I already pre-ordered the player's handbook, but it was specifically so I can start working on what's going to be in the SRD ahead of time. And I don't really plan on running a lot of D&D 2024, unless of course that is what my players are voraciously asking for um which i think a lot of gms end up in that position um but really i'm i'm looking at it as a toolkit for designing a smoother game that fits the needs of my table first so i'm really interested in uh dagger heart in particular even though i don't think it's necessarily my kind of game but i i i want to see what happens when you do create drastic change and have a community that actually supports it. So just the mentality of like, oh no, everybody gets to pick when they go and they can like jump in at any time. And you have this really like active sort of uh, space when it comes to your your table participating in combat. When it comes to shaking people out of a out of a really ingrained mindset, it's best to do that with a new game. So I'm excited to see what the future of TTRPGs will, will hold now that we do have a lot of competitors sort of entering the space and creating their own takes on rules. Because if anything, it'll help shape our mentality and the op open up some design space for future designers to feel confident creating something that's less familiar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the one thing like go back to expedience of play that I will credit Wizards of the Coast with, which you won't hear me say that a lot, uh, is that the general rules of 2024 have been streamlined. So if you ignore spells, character classes, subclasses, whatever, if you look at just the core rules of the game, it's like 29 pages. It is not very long. Um, they condensed a lot of kind of the crunchier aspects and a lot of the floating rules. Um, you still They still have the dodge action. Um, <laughs> but they, a lot of like what the core system is, uh, having listened to a lot of people who had gotten advanced copies of the book, um, it does sound like a much smoother system overall. Yeah. So in regards to the dodge action, uh, it's not bad to have rules like that. I think it's the overabundance, over reliance on, on these sorts of floating rules that kind of, it, it just makes it more difficult because the people who are going to buy the game are going to be the DMs, right? And because of that, they are naturally expected to hold the majority of the knowledge. But there still should be some expectation, some expectation put on the player that, hey, they need to know how to play the game. If you can get that knowledge gap down to a minimum, the game will just be more fun, uh, more or quicker to, to run because people aren't like running back to the book nonstop to, to look things up. And again, the DMs are the ones who are usually buying these sorts of products. So anything that you make player facing, this is another reason why I'm a proponent of like when it's on your character sheet, it should be like all the rules that you need on your, your character sheet. And I think Powered by the Apocalypse games are really good about doing this because they have like a, uh, a playbook and things are like pretty spelled out for you. So it becomes very easy to understand what you should be doing uh, in, in those games. So I think we can design for it we can just be really cognizant of the load that we are placing on different parts of our table and just the, the core rules in general. Hopefully you found something uh, interesting, helpful, or entertaining. If you did, please feel free to like, subscribe, tell your friends about the channel. Is Cheddar still around? Cheddar's, Cheddar's back there. Say goodbye to Cheddar. <laughs> Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.